Chapter 4. We've covered the kind of mobile home to look for and the price we want to pay. Now let's get into how to find one. In this country and about 350,000 new homes being manufactured each year, so it's not hard to find one. And you only need one to get started. There are now over 9 million mobile homes and the hardest part of teaching folks about this mobile home business is getting them to see, and believe, what excellent opportunities are out there. And then be able to get them motivated to the point where they will take action and do that first deal. You wouldn't believe some of the excuses I've heard over the years from people that insist on maintaining a, stinking thinking, attitude. According to a study by Harvard University, 85% of success is a result of your attitude. If you're convinced you can't do it, you're right. Dot you can't. If you're convinced you can do it, you're right. Dot you can. So let's develop the right attitude and get started. The only person really stopping you, is you. Most likely many of you folks have never bought are sold a mobile home and know nothing about them. Some of you may never have been inside of a mobile home, but don't let that stop you from getting started. I'm going to start at the very beginning and explain how to find one that you can buy and resell quickly, and make a good profit. If you've never been exposed to this type of business, you're in for a very nice and profitable experience. And if you're never known what it's like to make big returns on your money, then settle back and, listen up. We're going to take a trip into mobile home country. We will be looking for very motivated sellers only. Not someone that simply just wants to sell, or doesn't need to sell, but the person that must sell their mobile home. And it could be for a number of reasons. A transfer out of the area, divorce, evicted from the park health reasons, buying a new home, and etc. Park owners, managers when you find a home like we've described, and the numbers sound good, check with the park owner, or manager and find out if it can stay on the lot before you sign a purchase agreement. Talk with the owner, manager and explain to them what you want to do, and make sure the home won't have to be moved off the lot. Stay away from moving them, especially when you're just starting out. If it's a new owner, manager that we've never met, or have never done business with, we usually say that we are trying to help a young couple find a place to live, and we're hoping to find them a mobile home in that particular park. We explain to them that it will be necessary to loan the couple the money to buy the home, and they will pay us back with monthly payments. I then ask the manager if it would be any problem keeping the home on the lot if we found one they like. The manager will usually tell us what's required, such as your buyer coming in and filling out an application, reading over the park rules, and what security deposit is required, and etc. We use this approach until the park managers get to know us and we can cultivate a good business relationship with them. Once they get comfortable with us and find out we're responsible people to do business with, we then ask them to furnish referrals on anyone wanting to buy or sell their homes. And we also offer to pay them referral fees. It's essential to get on good terms with the park owner, manager because they are the people that must approve your buyer for the lot rental. They will also furnish you with your best referrals. Our best deals have come from referrals from park owners, managers. Sometimes they have a bank repo in their park and are looking for someone that will buy and keep it on the lot. Or, they may have an abandoned home in the park, or they might know of a sheriff's sale coming up on a home. So do whatever it takes to not only build up a good working relationship, but a good reputation. A good reputation will be one of the best assets you will ever have, and good or bad, will follow you wherever you remember. A bad reputation travels much faster than a good reputation. If you creditability, protect it by whatever means it takes. If your reputation and creditability need improving, make every effort to do so. Or, 
Be prepared to suffer the consequences if you don't. Go. And always have a good reputation. Classified ads a good place to start looking for that first home is in your local newspapers under the classified ad column that lists mobile homes for sale. Check for the type home I've described. You are looking for a home that is somewhere between 10 and 20 years old and priced around $6,000 or less. This will be a single wide, at least 12x60, or better yet, a 14x70. There are still good deals to be made in 12 wides, but they are gradually going the way of the 10 wide. Especially since there are now 16x80 foot homes being manufactured. When I say look for one priced around $6,000, that doesn't mean you will pay $6,000, but call anyway. Make sure that it's set up on a lot and doesn't have to be moved. You don't want to get into moving one when you're just starting out. It can be very frustrating and could turn you against this business before you have a chance to realize what a great business it is. Get some experience first before having one moved. Look for wording in the ads that may tip you off as to how motivated and anxious the seller is. Words like must sell moving out of area, best offer, being transferred, negotiable, estate sale, and etc. Check for anything that will alert you to the fact that the seller not only wants to sell, but they must sell that home. One time I called on an ad that said, must sell this week, and the asking price was $2,500. I bought that home for $1,500 and sold it in less than a week for $4,900, 500 Singapore dollars down and a note for 30 months. My yield. Good enough. When you call on one that sounds like what you're looking for, and the seller appears to be ready and anxious to sell, make an appointment and go look at it right away. Don't put it off. If it's a good deal someone else might very well beat you to it. A wise man once said, you don't steal in slow motion. Don't procrastinate. And don't wait for every little thing to be just like you think it should be. There's no such thing as the perfect deal, so just find a good deal and do it without getting too greedy. Buy from private sellers the homes you are looking for are those for sale by the owner, not the dealers. Later, IIL explain how to buy from dealers, but for now just talk with the private owners. Find out if they are still living in the home. If so, ask them when they need to move. Try to find out why they're moving and their real reason for selling. Also, ask them if they own the home free and clear and if they have the title in their possession. Refer to buyer's question list in the appendix section. If they don't have the title and have to pay off the bank in order to get clear title, find out if it's a local bank where you can just walk in with the seller, pay them off, and receive the title. If it's a bank out of the area, or out of state, it presents more of a problem usually in a case like this, the seller doesn't have the money to pay the loan off and get the title. Of course, the bank is not going to release the title until they have their money. That sometimes presents a problem, but let it be the seller's problem, not yours. I don't advise that you pay the buyer for the home on a promise of that buyer getting the title, especially if you're just getting started in this business. We've done this a number of times, but only after we had gained some experience and felt sure that we wouldn't have a problem. It can be risky to send your money to a bank for a title that's in someone else's name, and hope that the seller will do what they promise. If the seller says they need money to get the title released, just tell them they will have to figure a way to do that but when they get it to call you. Make your purchase agreement subject to you receiving clear title at the time you make payment for the home. And don't pay them until they have vacated the home and left it in the condition they agreed to. Run your own ads Another good way to find homes is to run your own ad in the paper.
One of our standard ads that we run continuously, and one we get good results from, is worded like this. We buy, sell and finance used mobile homes. Affordable prices. Flexible terms. No banks. As you can see, this ad appeals to both seller and buyer. It tells a seller that we buy homes. It tells a buyer that we sell homes. It also tells a buyer that we will finance the home if they need financing. And it also lets them know that they won't have to deal with banks, jump through flaming hoops, sign endless stacks of forms, and wait forever, only to be told their loan wasn't approved. This fact alone will generate calls from people that hate dealing with banks, or can't qualify for bank financing. When you run this type ad you will get calls from all kinds of sellers. Some of the calls may not sound like anything that you would be interested in, but don't be too quick to hang up. Talk with the seller and find out all you can about what they have for sale, why they're selling, when they have to move, are they about to lose the home, and anything that may alert you to a very motivated seller and a possible deal. You never know what you will learn from people if you can just get them to talking. So learn to listen carefully, and concentrate on what the other party is saying. Sometimes you will discover that what started out to be something you didn't think would be of interest, turns into a good opportunity. So always be on the alert for a good opportunity, and learn to recognize an opportunity when it comes your way. And if you know it's a good deal, take action. Don't try to steal in slow motion. Private publications Another place you should look is in the little private publications, or magazines. These are the local papers that you find around checkout counters at your grocery store, or on newsstands at the local convenience stores, and etc. They are either free, or cost very little. Check these papers for mobile homes that are for sale. You should also consider running your ad in these papers for the homes you will have for sale. This is a good way to reach the type of people that you are looking for. People that are not only are looking for a home to buy, but also the ones that want to sell a mobile home. Place your ad to buy a home, sell a home, or both. And leave it running for at least a month. The ad should be very inexpensive and produce good results. Bulletin boards many stores, hardware stores, laundromats, and etc. have bulletin boards that you can place a notice on. Make up your notice on a 3x5 card saying you want to buy a used mobile home. Include any information, price, model, size, location, and etc that you want to put on it. Then go around to all the places that have bulletin boards and post your notice. Keep your notice posted all the time, and change it frequently. Talk with employees of gas stations near mobile home parks and let them know what you do. Offer them a referral fee if they refer someone to you and it results in a deal. Spread the word to anyone and everyone that you are in the used mobile home business. Once you've been doing it a while, you will start getting referrals and calls by word of mouth. We once got an outstanding deal through a referral from a woman we had sold a home to. This woman happened to be in the little neighborhood tavern that was close to the park. She struck up a conversation with another woman who mentioned she needed to sell her home. The seller was given my phone number and called me. We checked out the home and bought it. It turned out to be a super deal for us. And all because of $100 referral fee. Mobile home movers get acquainted with the people that move and set up mobile homes in your area. The movers are familiar with all the parks and owners, managers. Let them know what you're doing and offer them referral fees. Also, let them know that if you need a home moved, you will have them do the moving and set up. The movers often get calls from people wanting to sell their homes to them. Normally, 
The movers aren't interested in buying and selling, their business is moving and setting up the homes. Banks and loan companies will sometimes have a mover pull a repo out of the park and place it in storage until a buyer can be found. If the mover knows you buy homes, you might be the new owner. The movers are also a good source to find material or parts for mobile homes if you want to do any fix up. They usually have a number of junkers that they can sell the parts from and the prices are very reasonable. One time we were able to get about $500 worth of vinyl skirting for free. The mover didn't want to spend the time or money to have it taken off a home that he had to move and offered it to us for free if we would take it off. This skirting was only about six months old. Another time, a mover sold us enough skirting to do two mobile homes for $100. So get to know the movers, they can mean business for you. Mail carriers and park workers get acquainted with the mail carriers that make deliveries in the parks. They are some of the first people to know if someone is moving, since they get a change of address notice. Some of the parks now have what is known as cluster boxes. This is where all the mailboxes for the entire park are placed in one location and the patrons go to the box to get their mail, instead of having it delivered to their door. I happened to be driving through a park that had just changed to this system, and noticed that someone with a mobile home for sale had placed a sign next to the mailboxes. This park has over 400 mobile homes. Just think of the exposure that sign received. That's an excellent place to post a sign saying you want to buy or sell a home. Be sure to have, will finance, in large letters on your sale sign. Also, get to know the people that work in the parks, electricians, maintenance people, meter readers, and etc. Leave your business card with them and offer referral fees. One good tip can mean big bucks in your pocket. Best source of leads Probably the best source of leads for buyers and sellers is the park owner or manager. By all means get to know these people and cultivate a good business relationship. Explain how you can provide them with a service by helping them keep the home on their lot rather than having it moved out when it's sold. When someone needs to sell their home, the park manager or owner is the first one to know. In many cases the seller will ask the manager to help them find a buyer. Be sure the manager has your name and phone number and know you pay a referral fee. We've gotten some excellent deals this way. And it means business for the park if they can keep the home on their lot instead of having it sold and moved. A vacant lot doesn't produce any rent. A park owner, who I had never met, called me one time and asked if I would be interested in placing some homes in his park. His park has 275 spaces, of which 12 were vacant at the time. There were also two homes that a bank had repossessed. The owner drove me through the park showing me the vacant pads and the two bank repos. He offered me two months free lot rent for each home that I moved in. He also volunteered to call the banker to inquire about selling me the repo homes, so they could stay in his park. While the park owner was giving me a tour of his park and trying to figure a way to fill his empty spaces, I couldn't help but wonder why he couldn't see the solution to his problem was so simple. He could simply find some nice used homes, place them on the lots, and either rent, or sell the home and carry the note. This way he would have a payment from the home, plus the lot rent. Obviously, it didn't occur to him to do that, and I didn't suggest it. And ironically, he was renting out part of his land that adjoined the park to a mobile home dealer. I feel sure that dealer could have arranged to find him some nice homes to fill his empty spaces. What did I say earlier about needing someone to show us the light switch?
A trip into the twilight zone I called the banker the next day to get some more information on the repo homes and what the bank would be willing to sell them for. The first home we discussed was a 14x70 that was three years old. The banker shuffled papers around and finally said they had $23,464 in that home. Welcome to the banker's world. I asked him what he would be willing to let it go for if I could take it off his hands immediately. Without any hesitation at all he answered, Oh, the full amount. Then he said, Oh, I forgot. We just paid two months lot rent. So we'll have to add that to the price. I'll have to have $23,954. Then I asked about the other one, which was 16 years old. The banker said they had $7,890 in that home, and they would have to have the full price for that one too. I said, good luck, as I hung up the phone. I felt like telling him to take my phone number, and if and when he ever came out of his coma and regained consciousness, to give me a call. Is there any wonder the banks stay in trouble? Just what chance does that banker have finding a buyer for either of those homes? At the time, I could have bought a nice new 14x70, three-bedroom home, set up on a lot, for much less than what this banker wanted for his three-year-old home. And each month the home sits on that lot, the bank gets to pay another month's lot rent and worry about it being vandalized. The bankers call this a non-performing asset. Doesn't that sound impressive? Guess it sounds much better than telling the stockholders that the bank goofed up and made a dumb loan, huh? I just finished telling you about a banker that was out of touch with reality and expected to get a ridiculous price for his repos, but I should explain that not all bankers think like that one does. We've gotten some excellent deals from the banks, but you have to reach the right people. The ones that are conscious and understand the situation they're in. The first bank repos we purchased were the result of a tip from a park manager. The manager told me about a repo in her park and furnished me with the name and phone number of the person that was handling it. It turned out that it really wasn't the bank I was dealing with but rather a company that handled the repos for the bank. In this case, when the bank repossessed a mobile home, they turned it over to this repo servicing company who would then try to locate a buyer for the home. Ask questions while I was talking to the manager of this company, I found out that he didn't have just one mobile home in that park, he had four. And even though he had four homes in this one park, and needed to get them off his books, getting this information out of him was like pulling teeth. Instead of him volunteering the information about the homes, I had to keep asking him questions until he remembered what he had. After a number of questions from me, he would say, oh, here's another one that I forgot about. Then he would tell me about that one. When we finished talking about that home, I would ask, what else do you have? He would answer, I think that's all. But, I kept him on the phone, and kept asking questions until he came up with another one. Finally I got information on all four. One of the best lessons I ever learned was to ask questions, instead of making statements and comments. That one lesson has made me a lot of money that I otherwise would not have made, as in this case. If you happen to be the type of person that likes to talk a lot, let me strongly recommend you get out of that habit and start asking more questions, and learn to listen. We checked out the home and bought it. It turned out to be a super deal for us. And all because of $100 referral fee. Mobile home movers get acquainted with the people that move and set up mobile homes in your area. The movers are familiar with all the parks and owners managers. Let them know what you're doing and offer them referral fees. Also, let them know that if you need a home moved, you will have them do the moving and setup. The movers often get calls from people wanting to sell their homes to them.
Normally, the movers aren't interested in buying and selling, their business is moving and setting up the homes. Banks and loan companies will sometimes have a mover pull a repo out of the park and place it in storage until a buyer can be found. If the mover knows you buy homes, you might be the new owner. The movers are also a good source to find material, or parts for mobile homes if you want to do any fix-up. They usually have a number of junkers that they can sell the parts from and the prices are very reasonable. One time we were able to get about $500 worth of vinyl skirting for free. The mover didn't want to spend the time or money to have it taken off a home that he had to move and offered it to us for free if we would take it off. This skirting was only about six months old. Another time, a mover sold us enough skirting to do two mobile homes for $100. So get to know the movers, they can mean business for you. Mail carriers and park workers get acquainted with the mail carriers that make deliveries in the parks. They are some of the first people to know if someone is moving, since they get a change of address notice. Some of the parks now have what is known as, cluster boxes. This is where all the mailboxes for the entire park are placed in one location and the patrons go to the box to get their mail, instead of having it delivered to their door. I happened to be driving through a park that had just changed to this system, and noticed that someone with a mobile home for sale had placed a sign next to the mailboxes. This park has over 400 mobile homes, just think of the exposure that sign received. That's an excellent place to post a sign saying you want to buy, or sell a home. Be sure to have, will finance, in large letters on your sale sign. Also, get to know the people that work in the parks, electricians, maintenance people, meter readers, and etc. Leave your business card with them and offer referral fees. One good tip can mean big bucks in your pocket. Best source of leads Probably the best source of leads for buyers and sellers is the park owner or manager. By all means get to know these people and cultivate a good business relationship. Explain how you can provide them with a service by helping them keep the home on their lot, rather than having it moved out when it's sold. When someone needs to sell their home, the park manager or owner is the first one to know. In many cases the seller will ask the manager to help them find a buyer. Be sure the manager has your name and phone number, and know you pay a referral fee. We've gotten some excellent deals this way. And it means business for the park if they can keep the home on their lot, instead of having it sold and moved. A vacant lot doesn't produce any rent. A park owner, who I had never met, called me one time and asked if I would be interested in placing some homes in his park. His park has 275 spaces, of which 12 were vacant at the time. There were also two homes that a bank had repossessed. The owner drove me through the park, showing me the vacant pads and the two bank repos. He offered me two months free lot rent for each home that I moved in. He also volunteered to call the banker to inquire about selling me the repo homes so they could stay in his park. While the park owner was giving me a tour of his park and trying to figure a way to fill his empty spaces, I couldn't help but wonder why he couldn't see the solution to his problem was so simple. He could simply find some nice used homes, place them on the lots, and either rent or sell the home and carry the note. This way he would have a payment from the home, plus the lot rent. Obviously, it didn't occur to him to do that, and I didn't suggest it. And ironically, he was renting out part of his land that adjoined the park to a mobile home dealer. I feel sure that dealer could have arranged to find him some nice homes to fill his empty spaces. What did I say earlier about needing someone to show us the light switch? A trip into the twilight zone I called the banker the next day to get some more information on the repo homes and what the bank would be willing to sell them for. The first home we discussed was a 14x70 that was three years old. The banker shuffled papers around and finally said they had $23,464 in that home.
Welcome to the banker's world. I asked him what he would be willing to let it go for if I could take it off his hands immediately. Without any hesitation at all he answered, oh, the full amount. Then he said, oh, I forgot, we just paid two months lot rent, so we'll have to add that to the price. I'll have to have $23,954. Then I asked about the other one, which was 16 years old. The banker said they had $7,890 in that home, and they would have to have the full price for that one too. I said, good luck, as I hung up the phone. I felt like telling him to take my phone number, and if and when he ever came out of his coma and regained consciousness, to give me a call. Is there any wonder the banks stay in trouble? Just what chance does that banker have finding a buyer for either of those homes? At the time, I could have bought a nice new 14x70, three-bedroom home, set up on a lot, for much less than what this banker wanted for his three-year-old home. And each month the home sits on that lot, the bank gets to pay another month's lot rent and worry about it being vandalized. The bankers call this a non-performing asset. Doesn't that sound impressive? Guess it sounds much better than telling the stockholders that the bank goofed up and made a dumb loan, huh? I just finished telling you about a banker that was out of touch with reality and expected to get a ridiculous price for his repos, but I should explain that not all bankers think like that one does. We've gotten some excellent deals from the banks, but you have to reach the right people the ones that are conscious and understand the situation they're in. The first bank repos we purchased were the result of a tip from a park manager. The manager told me about a repo in her park and furnished me with the name and phone number of the person that was handling it. It turned out that it really wasn't the bank I was dealing with, but rather a company that handled the repos for the bank. In this case, when the bank repossessed a mobile home, they turned it over to this repo servicing company who would then try to locate a buyer for the home. Ask questions while I was talking to the manager of this company, I found out that he didn't have just one mobile home in that park, he had four. And even though he had four homes in this one park, and needed to get them off his books, getting this information out of him was like pulling teeth. Instead of him volunteering the information about the homes, I had to keep asking him questions until he remembered what he had. After a number of questions from me, he would say, oh, here's another one that I forgot about. Then he would tell me about that one. When we finished talking about that home, I would ask, what else do you have? He would answer, I think that's all. But, I kept him on the phone, and kept asking questions until he came up with another one. Finally I got information on all four. One of the best lessons I ever learned was to ask questions, instead of making statements and comments. That one lesson has made me a lot of money that I otherwise would not have made, as in this case. If you happen to be the type of person that likes to talk a lot, let me strongly recommend you get out of that habit and start asking more questions, and learn to listen. Talking will cost you money. Listening will make you money. In this case, by asking questions, I was able to purchase four homes in the same park. It turned out to be a splendid deal. We bought several more homes from this manager but it was frustrating just to get him to go to the trouble of looking through his files and telling me what he had on the books. But since it's not his money tied up in the homes, why should he be too concerned? His top priority was probably 5 o'clock, quitting time, and payday. When dealing with banks, or people that represent the banks, you need to talk with the person who has the authority to actually make the decision. Clerks and bookkeepers don't have the authority to make a decision, so find out who the head honcho is and ask for him, her. And be prepared for some frustration. These people aren't playing with their money, 
So don't expect them to put a lot of thought into making a sensible decision. I've seen many cases where they wouldn't accept a good offer, even when it was in their best interest to do so. In some cases, I think the banks will give the repo company a ballpark figure of what they are willing to settle for, or hope to get for the home. If the manager gets an offer that's less than what they want, he, she has to call the bank and get approval to accept a lower offer. But don't be afraid to make low offers, and don't be intimidated when the bank tells you how much money is owed on the home. Who cares what's owed? Offer what the home is worth to you, and don't worry about what the bank has in it. In many cases the banks don't really have any idea what the home is worth, they only know how much they have in the note. Sometimes the only thing they go by is the amount of money owed by the people that stopped paying. So, it's a case of the bank making a dumb loan, and now they're looking for someone that's even dumber to bail them out. It's called, the greater fool theory. In some cases, the banks will send someone out and get a condition report of the home. Supposedly, this will give them a more realistic opinion of what they can expect to sell the home for. But that's not always the case. It depends on how experienced and knowledgeable that inspector is. For someone not experienced in repairs, a simple, or minor repair job can appear to be terrible. And that inspector makes a report of what he, she thinks it's worth based on their opinion of how much work they think is needed. That's the kind of inspectors I like, because that's when I stand to make an excellent buy. Since the condition report is all the bank has to go on, they sometimes make bad decisions based on that report, and may be influenced to sell the home for a much lower price than the home is worth. So find out who handles bank repos in your ACA, and talk with the person in charge who actually has the authority to make a decision. It does take patience, but once you locate such a person, it can mean some fabulous deals for you. If the bank has more than one home, Offer to take several, or all of them, if they will give you a good price on a package deal. Non-performing assets The best time to make such an offer is near the end of the month, or the end of their calendar year. That's when they are most anxious to clear their books of, non-performing assets. I always thought anything that didn't perform was a liability, not an asset. But then I never went to banker's school. Let me share one of our bank repo deals we did to illustrate my point on a bank non-performing asset. One day I received a fax from a company that handled bank repos. I had bought several homes from this company before, so they kept me informed on most of the homes in my area that were for sale. They had just gotten possession of another repo and wanted to know if I would be interested in making a bid. This home was in a local park, but instead of giving the name of the park, and the address and lot number, their fax had only the directions of how to reach the home. The directions were to turn off the interstate at a certain exit, go so far and make another turn, go several miles and make another turn, and etc. As well as I know my area and the mobile home parks, I was having trouble trying to figure out where this park was located. When I finally did, it turned out to be one of my favorite parks. If the person sending the fax had simply given the address and lot number, I would have known at once where the home was located. But they didn't even furnish the name of the park. Then I thought, if I have trouble figuring out which park it is, and where it's located, as well as I know the area, how much competition would I have? I figured that nobody else would know where it was located either, or go to the trouble to find out. After learning where the home was, I called the park manager and asked him to tell me what he knew about this home. He told me the owners had skipped out about two weeks before, that the electric was still on, and from what he could see the home appeared to be in good condition. This should emphasize again how important it is to maintain a good relationship with the park manager. After talking with the park manager, I made a trip to the home and checked it out. All the doors were locked, 
So I had to use my master keys, putty knife and screwdriver. I turned on all the appliances and AC, and found them to be in good working order. All this home really needed was about an hour's clean up time to get rid of the beer cans, scraps of food, and pizza boxes. I was well pleased with this home, and I could smell blood. My next step was to get back with the repo company. When I called the repo company back for more information, I was told the people in the home had walked away owing the bank $16,000. This was a 14x60 home that was 12 years old. It couldn't have been worth that much when it was sold to this couple two years before. But the bank must have thought so. They financed more than that for the dealer that sold it. After I expressed my shock at how much was owed, I asked the lady how much the bank was willing to settle for. She said she didn't know, they needed at least three bids and the bank usually accepted the highest one. So far, they had not received any bids. I thought, no wonder, from your directions nobody could find the home. I then told her I would call around and try to get her at least three bids and try to help her sell this home. She thanked me for being so helpful. I called two other dealers that I know, explained the situation, and asked if they wanted to make a bid. They both said they would. So, with their two bids, together with mine, the bank now had the three bids they needed to get rid of this non-performing asset. I love the term. As luck would have it, my bid was the highest of the three. The bank sold me the home for $2,120, which was the highest offer they were able to get. No, that's not a typo. The bank was owed $16,000, and they sold it to me for $2,120. But I emphasize that I could have a certified check in the mail for $5,125 that day if he accepted. There was a long period of silence and I could almost hear him thinking, should I grab a sure thing, or gamble on getting a better offer? Finally he said, okay, send me the check. We had the home sold for $12,900 before we got the title. So be sure to always include a deadline in your offer for any property that you make a bid on. Ride through the parks Another way we've been able to find homes is to just ride through the various parks that we like to do business in and look for homes that have, for sale, signs in the window. When we spot a home that fits our category, we just stop and knock on the door. If the owner is home, they will usually invite you in when you tell them you're interested in buying their home. I prefer this method better than writing the phone number down, going home and calling, then having to go back out if it sounds good. You're already there, so why not check it out then? It will save you time, and you can inspect the home and evaluate whether it's worthwhile to pursue it further. For convenience, I carry a small pocket size cassette recorder with me. If the owners aren't home, I dictate the address, phone number, and any information on the home into the recorder. When I get home, I play the information back and make a file on that home for future reference. This is much easier than trying to write the address and phone number on a piece of paper, especially while you're driving. Once you're inside the home and the owner starts talking, just let them talk. Ask a question every so often and they will normally tell you everything you want to know. After a few minutes you can tell if this home fits in with your game plan. If the price is right, and I'm satisfied with the home, I try to get a purchase agreement drawn up right then. I'll put up a small deposit, usually $100, and tie it up. If it's a good deal, tie it up some way. If you're not sure you want the home, you could put in your purchase agreement that it's subject to the park allowing it to remain on the lot, subject to inspection and approval of your spouse, or partner, or subject to anything you want. If you change your mind later, you have an escape clause to cancel the agreement. Also, 
While driving through the park, stop and talk to the park residents. Ask if they know anyone that has a home for sale, or if they know anyone that wants to buy one. If you do this many times I can almost guarantee you that you will get some leads. Knock on doors on several occasions. I've just walked through the park knocking on doors. When someone opened the door I would say, Excuse me, someone told me there was a mobile home for sale on this street, but I forgot the address. Do you happen to know which home is for sale? Knock on enough doors, and sooner or later someone will say, Oh yeah, the one over there is for sale. Or, yeah, that's the one down on the corner that old Oscar has been trying to sell. Bingo, now I have a good lead. When I hear this, I then quiz the person about how long it's been for sale, why the owner is selling, what the asking price is, how long the seller has lived in the home, what kind of people the sellers are, and etc. I find out all I can about Oscar and his situation, so three be in a better negotiating position when I go and meet with him. By the time I actually knock on Oscar's door, I'll already know a lot about him. I call this doing your homework. So make contacts with as many of the park residents as you can, and leave your name and address with every person you talk with. Be sure they know that you offer financing, and that you pay referral fees if they refer someone to you and it results in a deal. Business cards have some business cards ready to hand out, and keep them simple and to the point. Don't try to make your card too fancy, or slick looking. A bunch of designations and letters on your card means nothing to your buyer, seller. They probably won't even know what they mean, and couldn't care less if they did. And even if they do, they aren't the least bit interested in whether you made the million dollar club, or how many homes you've bought and sold. The only thing they're interested in is finding a buyer for their home. Also, have your cards printed with type that can be easily read. I've thrown away many cards that people have handed out at seminars and conventions because they were simply too hard to read, or too confusing. But I emphasize that I could have a certified check in the mail for $5,125 that day if he accepted. There was a long period of silence, and I could almost hear him thinking, should I grab a sure thing, or gamble on getting a better offer? Finally he said, okay send me the check. We had the home sold for $12,900 before we got the title. So be sure to always include a deadline in your offer for any property that you make a bid on. Ride through the parks Another way we've been able to find homes is to just ride through the various parks that we like to do business in and look for homes that have, for sale, signs in the window. When we spot a home that fits our category, we just stop and knock on the door. If the owner is home, they will usually invite you in when you tell them you're interested in buying their home. I prefer this method better than writing the phone number down, going home and calling, then having to go back out if it sounds good. You're already there, so why not check it out then? It will save you time, and you can inspect the home and evaluate whether it's worthwhile to pursue it further. For convenience, I carry a small pocket size cassette recorder with me. If the owners aren't home, I dictate the address, phone number, and any information on the home into the recorder. When I get home, I play the information back and make a file on that home for future reference. This is much easier than trying to write the address and phone number on a piece of paper, especially while you're driving. Once you're inside the home and the owner starts talking, just let them talk. Ask a question every so often and they will normally tell you everything you want to know. After a few minutes you can tell if this home fits in with your game plan. If the price is right, and I'm satisfied with the home, I try to get a purchase agreement drawn up right then. I'll put up a small deposit, usually $100, and tie it up. If it's a good deal, tie it up some way. If you're not sure you want the home, you could put in your purchase agreement that it's subject to the park allowing it to remain on the lot, 
subject to inspection and approval of your spouse or partner, or subject to anything you want. If you change your mind later, you have an escape clause to cancel the agreement. Also, while driving through the park, stop and talk to the park residents. Ask if they know anyone that has a home for sale, or if they know anyone that wants to buy one. If you do this many times I can almost guarantee you that you will get some leads. Knock on doors on several occasions, I've just walked through the park knocking on doors. When someone opened the door I would say, excuse me, someone told me there was a mobile home for sale on this street, but I forgot the address. Do you happen to know which home is for sale? Knock on enough doors, and sooner or later someone will say, oh yeah, the one over there is for sale. Or, yeah, that's the one down on the corner that old Oscar has been trying to sell. Bingo, now I have a good lead. When I hear this, I then quiz the person about how long it's been for sale, why the owner is selling, what the asking price is, how long the seller has lived in the home, what kind of people the sellers are, and etc. I find out all I can about Oscar and his situation, so 3 be in a better negotiating position when I go and meet with him. By the time I actually knock on Oscar's door, I'll already know a lot about him. I call this doing your homework. So make contacts with as many of the park residents as you can, and leave your name and address with every person you talk with. Be sure they know that you offer financing, and that you pay referral fees if they refer someone to you and it results in a deal. Business cards have some business cards ready to hand out, and keep them simple and to the point. Don't try to make your card too fancy, or slick looking. A bunch of designations and letters on your card means nothing to your buyer, seller. They probably won't even know what they mean, and couldn't care less if they did. And even if they do, they aren't the least bit interested in whether you made the million dollar club, or how many homes you've bought and sold. The only thing they're interested in is finding a buyer for their home. Also, have your cards printed with type that can be easily read. I've thrown away many cards that people have handed out at seminars and conventions because they were simply too hard to read, or too confusing. Some of them had such fancy type that it was like trying to read a menu in an overpriced restaurant, rather than a business card. If the person you hand your card to has trouble reading it, or if they don't understand what it says, your card will most likely wind up in the trash can. Maybe now would be a good time for you to take a good look at your card and see if you need to make any changes to it. Is it easy to read? Can a person tell at a glance exactly what message you're trying to get across? Is your phone number complete with your area code? If not, how will someone outside of your area, or in another state, be able to call you? Is your address complete with the proper zip code? My mobile home business card reads, used mobile prices flexible homes bought sold financed. Terms. No banks. Stop renting start buying, and my name and phone number. Nothing fancy, or intimidating to the people I hand them to affordable it's a simple card but it says a lot if you have a home for sale iil buy it if you want to buy a home i'll sell you one if you need financing i'll do that and also that i'm flexible on prices and terms and you don't have to deal with banks so keep your card simple and don't try to impress people when you find a home that you would like to buy but the price is too high look it over anyway Tell the owner that you really would like to buy it, but it's just out of your price range and the numbers just don't work. Then give them your card and ask them to keep you in mind if they don't find a buyer, or if they can see a way to do better on the price. And keep in touch with them. Some of them will be calling you later when they can't get it sold. In one case the seller started out wanting $5,000 for their home. We left our name and phone number, and after a period of time of just waiting and negotiating, we bought that home for $2,000. So don't just assume the seller won't lower their price. They might be real firm on it today, but after a month or two without any offers, you might get that call wanting you to come back out and talk some more. 
especially if time has run out for them to move into their new house, or they have to move out of the area. If the sellers should be getting transferred next week, and realize they have to find a buyer in a hurry, or pay lot rent on a vacant home, they get real motivated. Their needs and circumstances can, and do, change overnight. Make sure they know how to get in contact with you if that happens. And keep in mind that you don't really care if you buy that home or not. But if you do buy, it's going to be at your price or terms, or you don't buy. The seller needs to sell, but you don't need to buy. And if you don't buy this one, there are plenty more for sale. Trade something for a mobile home if you have something you no longer want, such as a car, boat, RV, timeshare, and etc. Place an ad in the paper that you will trade that item for a mobile home. This can be a good way to get full value for that something you no longer want. You could also offer to add some cash with that something, to make it very appealing to the seller. Several times when we had a house for sale, we stated in the ad that we would take a mobile home, car, pickup truck, boat, land, and etc. in trade, or for the down payment. And we backquote they had some crazy offers. Be a little creative and realize that you don't always need money to put a deal together. Think of something that seller might want, or accept, in place look in bad parks here's an idea you might want to consider. You may have several parks in your area that are real crummy and run down, or just a bad area that you wouldn't want to do business in. Check those parks and see what's for sale. Chances are, the seller of a home in that kind of a park is having a hard time finding a cash buyer that wants to live in such a park. If so, you should be able to negotiate a very good purchase price. If you can buy at the right price, then move the home to a nice park. Just be sure you already have a place that you can move the home to. Also, what the total cost of the move setup will be. If the numbers are right, you could create a good deal from a bad park. We normally don't like to get into moving and setting homes, but we ll do it if the figures are good enough. And we've done several that turned out extremely good. Several times when we had a house for sale, we stated in the ad that we would take a mobile home, car, pickup truck, boat, land, and etc. in trade, or for the down payment. And we backquote they had some crazy offers. Be a little creative and realize that you don't always need money to put a deal together. Think of something that seller might want, or accept, in place look in bad parks here's an idea you might want to consider. You may have several parks in your area that are real crummy and run down, or just a bad area that you wouldn't want to do business in. Check those parks and see what's for sale. Chances are, the seller of a home in that kind of a park is having a hard time finding a cash buyer that wants to live in such a park. If so, you should be able to negotiate a very good purchase price. If you can buy at the right price, then move the home to a nice park. Just be sure you already have a place that you can move the home to. Also, what the total cost of the move setup will be. If the numbers are right, you could create a good deal from a bad park. We normally don't like to get into moving and setting homes, but we ll do it if the figures are good enough. And we've done several that turned out extremely good. Working with dealers check out the new mobile home dealers in your area and see what they have on hand. It's been my experience that most of the new dealers are only concerned with new sales. Sometimes they will make you a very good offer on an older home they've just taken in trade. In one case, a dealer called me on a home he had just taken in trade. The new home was set up in a different park, so the one taken in trade didn't have to be moved. In a case like this, the dealer will usually try to find a buyer for the trade-in before any lot rent has to be paid. If the lot rent becomes due before they find a buyer, they usually have it pulled onto their lot and stored. If that happens, you will now have to figure in the cost of a setup. 
So it's much better to negotiate with the dealer before the home is moved off the lot. This dealer offered to sell me the home for $2,500 when he first took it in trade, and was still on the park lot. A few days later, he dropped his price to $1,500. After several more days he dropped the price to $1,300. He was willing to take almost any price to keep from paying to have it moved to his lot, and then having to find a buyer. We got to know this particular dealer by stopping at his lot one day to see what he had in low-priced, used homes. We explained to him that we were looking for a mobile home for a young couple that needed a place to live, but didn't have much money. If we could find a home they could afford, we would buy it for them, and let them make monthly payments to us. So, the home would have to be inexpensive and already set up on a lot. The dealer showed us pictures of several homes that were still in the park, and the asking prices. We found two that looked interesting, got the keys and checked them out. One was 14x60, 12 years old and in excellent condition. The other was 12x65, 16 years old, and in good condition. We negotiated a quick cash price of $7,500 for both. We immediately placed A for sale, will finance, sign in both. Two days later I got a call from a man that was driving through the park looking for a home. He saw my sign, called me, and I sold him the 14X60 model for $8,900. He paid $1,000 down and signed a note for the balance. The 12X65 model was sold in three weeks for $4,000 cash. So it does pay to get acquainted with the new dealers. Let them know you are in the market for low-priced used homes, and that you will even consider a fixer-upper if the price is right. They won't consider you a competitor, but rather someone that can take some of their used homes off their hands. It's good business for both of you. I'm always amazed, and puzzled, to see so many of the new dealers overlook, and pass up what I consider the best money makers. The used homes. They seem to focus only on selling a new home, making a one-time profit, and never seem to think about financing any of the older homes. And financing is where the real money is. In my opinion, they're letting an awful lot of money slip through their fingers. New Homes vs Used Homes A friend of mine is the sales manager for one of the local new mobile home dealers. He explained to me the floor plan and profit potential for a new factory delivered home. After explaining all this to me, I was more convinced than ever there's more profit in the older, used homes than in the new homes. And, they're a lot easier and simpler to do. When I got home, I did some supposing. See if you agree with my thinking. According to my friend, this is basically how the floor plan works. Suppose the factory charges the dealer $20,000 for a new single wide home. The bank, or some lending institution pays the factory for the home. The bank then charges the dealer interest on the $20,000. The interest is payable at a predetermined rate, which might be the current prime rate, plus two points. For illustration purposes, let's suppose the prime rate is 8%. That would mean that every month that home sits on the dealer's lot, the dealer has to pay the bank 10% interest, 10% of $20,000 which amounts to $166 monthly. If the home is not sold after 6 months, the bank can curtail the loan, which means that the dealer must now pay the bank 10% of the cost of the home, which in this case would be $2,000, 10% of the $20,000 dealer cost. In some cases, if it's not sold in a reasonable time period, the bank can require the dealer, or factory, to pay the remaining balance off. The dealer's profit markup on this new home is approximately 25-30%. So, if the factory charges the dealer $20,000 for the home, the dealer prices the home somewhere around $25,000 minus $26,000, plus setup cost, and any additional items the buyer wants with the home such as AC, skirting, decks, and etc. According to my dealer friend, a $5,000 profit on a $20,000 home is real good. 
He also told me they had to sell at least three to four homes each month just to pay expenses and break even. When the dealer finds a buyer for this home, the buyer will, in most cases, be required to qualify for a bank loan in order to buy. I just recently talked with two dealers and they both said that it was becoming more and more difficult to qualify people for a bank loan to buy a new home. One dealer told me that he used to be able to qualify seven to eight applicants out of ten. Now he said he's lucky to qualify two to three out of ten. Seeing the stack of applications on his desk, I have to believe he was telling the truth. I'm sure there's a lot more about the new mobile home business that I don't know about, but based on what I do know, I'll stick to the cheapo deals. And I'll bet you that I'll wind up with more money, with far less work. To illustrate my point, here's two of our recent deals. One was a home that we had a total of $5,300 invested. We sold that home for $10,900, $1,500 down and a note payable $237 monthly. The other was a home that we had $4,700 invested, and we sold that one for $12,000 cash. Neither of these homes was a typical Lonnie Cheapo deal, but they were too good to pass up. Since most new dealers seem to have blinders on when it comes to selling and financing the used homes, there should be some good opportunities for you to arrange financing for those homes. Try working out a pre-arranged wholesale price with the dealer for a particular home. Then have them advertise the home at retail price, with financing available. You get to be the bank, and you can work out the terms to suit you. Or, the dealer could sell the home and carry the note. Then you buy the note at a discount price that you're happy with. Just be sure to check out the buyer the same as you would if you were selling them the home, so you don't wind up with a deadbeat. Okay, so much for new dealers. By now you should have enough ideas on how to find that first mobile home. They're not that hard to find if you will just get out and start looking. Now, let's get into what to look for.